This is Dr. Ronald Schwartz speaking to you from the University of Rochester Medical Center. We're going to discuss the case of a 47-year-old man with atypical chest pain. This man presents with prolonged chest pressure lasting several hours overnight with unexplained sweating at rest. He had no history of heart disease. He does have a history of type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, dyslipidemia associated with high triglycerides, low HDL, and small dense LDL, the so-called atherogenic dyslipidemia. And he has a family history of a father who had a premature myocardial infarction. He is admitted for evaluation. His physical examination was thought to be unremarkable. On the next slide, we see his electrocardiogram. It shows normal sinus rhythm with a normal repolarization pattern and is considered a normal tracing despite some baseline wandering. On the next slide, we delve more deeply into the case description. His ECG was considered interpretable with no acute findings of ischemia. His cardiac biomarkers were normal. So what should be done next? Should an inpatient versus an outpatient evaluation be done? What type of test should be done to further evaluate his symptoms? On the next slide, we evaluate his chest pain and the likelihood of coronary heart disease. He's a 47-year-old man with three risk factors. The typical location of his discomfort was found to be substernal. The discomfort was not caused to be by stress, and it was not noted to be relieved by rest. Therefore, he has one out of three of the characteristics of chest discomfort, and by the angina guidelines would be considered non-anginal chest pain. Because he's in his 40s, and he's a male, uh, with this type of chest pain, he's considered to be at intermediate risk. On the next slide, we examine the appropriateness of imaging by appropriate use criteria. And we see that indication number three, intermediate pretest probability of coronary disease with an interpretable ECG and ability to exercise, would place exercise radionuclide imaging as an appropriate choice for him. We note that exercise ECG would also be appropriate, as would uh, stress echocardiography. Stress cardiac MR and CCTA, uh, coronary uh, angiography, non-invasively, would be considered may be appropriate. Calcium scoring and invasive angiography would be considered rarely appropriate by the guidelines. Exercise stress-only imaging was performed. He was exercised on a standard Bruce protocol for 13 minutes, 53 seconds, and achieved 15 minutes of activity. His excellent exercise tolerance was found for his age expected exercise of 10 to 11 minutes, so he exceeded the expected workload. His normal physiologic responses of heart rate and blood pressure to exercise were noted. No chest pain during a stress test was noted. There was no ECG evidence of ischemia during exercise. There was no initial rest study performed. On the next slide, we see that he had a technically excellent quality uh, study. His myocardial perfusion is seen to be completely normal in all regions. In the red circle, we see the short axes and the long axes of the uh, tomograms showing normal myocardial perfusion. The quantitation showed normal quantitative assessment with normal wall motion and a normal ejection fraction of 72%. The next slide illustrates the normal quantitative assessment by the polar quantification and the quantification of his ejection fraction, which was found to be normal at 72%, and he had normal wall motion by gated imaging. In the next slide, we see that he had, indeed, normal volumes as well as normal ejection fraction. On the next slide, we see that we sent the report to the physician showing normal myocardial perfusion scan at high cardiac workload. He had a normal exercise tolerance test. His left ventricular ejection fraction was normal at 72% with normal regional function. Because of these findings, rest study was not required. The stress test was unequivocally normal. The impression was that of non-cardiac chest pain, and we could rapidly decide to uh, send him out with the confidence that his long-term outcome over the next year would be extremely low, much less than 1% for a hard coronary event of non-fatal or fatal heart attack. Follow-up at one month was planned. Uh, the patient reported uh, symptoms which were improved with omeprazole and antacid twice daily. 
Now, on the next slide, we examine why stress-only imaging was a rational choice for this patient. A normal stress-only image has the same favorable prognosis as a normal stress rest study. Radiation exposure is reduced by at least 60%. Stress-first imaging reduces the length of stay for patients in the emergency room or chest pain unit, reducing the cost of care. Low-risk scans requiring rest studies could be done as an outpatient. On the next slide, we look at the survival curves based on the Duke treadmill score, which is an exercise ECG tool which we use to measure risk by the exercise ECG without imaging. On the left panel, A, we see a low-risk Duke treadmill score with no differences in the stress-only curve uh, identified in red compared to the stress and rest imaging curve identified in blue. On the right-sided B panel, we see the outcomes with these Kaplan-Meier curves of the intermediate risk Duke treadmill score. This is the category that our patient was in. And again, we see that the stress-only curve in red and the stress plus rest imaging curve in blue have similar outcomes for the first uh, six to seven years. On the next slide, we document the findings of uh, others which have shown 61% less radiopharmaceutical usage with stress-only protocol, meaning less radiation exposure uh, to the patient. Because this was a high-sensitivity CZT-SPEC study, the patient actually received little over one millisievert, ultra-low-dose exposure, with an excellent prognostic as well as diagnostic test showing normal perfusion with good outcome. At this point, I'd like to turn the discussion over to Andrea Medina, assistant professor and academic internist at Oklahoma University in Oklahoma City. Andrea? Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. So I'm an outpatient and inpatient internist, but I want to highlight um, this case from the perspective of an outpatient primary care physician. So again, this is a 47-year-old white male, and he came to you with non-exertional left-sided chest pressure, and this was lasting hours overnight and associated with sweating. Um, he was eventually admitted for evaluation and workup, and looking at his history, we see he has several risk factors for coronary artery disease. He has dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension. He has coronary artery disease history and a first-degree relative, his father. So, of course, your suspicion is uh, is peaked, and you want to work this gentleman up. Um, he had an EKG that was done, and we see no changes that were consistent with ischemia, no evidence of ST elevation MI. Cardiac markers were normal. So now what? You still have a patient with some risk factors who's experiencing chest pain. What imaging would you do? Would you do imaging? Uh, and so for as a primary care physician, this is where the appropriate use criteria can be very helpful. So first, let's go back and, again, consider the characteristics of his chest pain. One, where is it? Two, is it exertional? Three, is it relieved by rest? So our patient here has only one of these characteristics, location, um, but he still has several risk factors. So we would consider this non-anginal or atypical chest pain, but he's classified at intermediate risk. And if you look at slide five, since he is between 40 to 49 years old um, and has atypical or probable angina, we would classify him as intermediate pretest probability for CAD. And again, if you look at the bottom on the, the table there, you see that's a pretty wide range, 10 to 90 percent pretest probability. So, so really what to do with him at this point? Um, when you look at slide six, that's an interpreted table from the AUC indication number three, um, a patient with intermediate risk who has an EKG that we can interpret, uh, who can exercise. In this patient, it would be appropriate for stress EKG, stress radionuclide imaging, or stress echo. Um, and, and one thing we want to, to really impress upon you is that it's, it's really only necessary to order the stress uh, component to the imaging. The, the rest component uh, in this case just really isn't of increased benefit. You have increased radiation exposure, longer le length of stay, and really no overall benefit 
to getting the rest and stress imaging. So this patient ended up having a normal myocardial perfusion scan. He was able to leave uh, safely, timely, and as you can see and as we reviewed, he was put on a PPI and this non-anginal chest discomfort uh, eventually resolved. So I, I think, again, this is a patient that we're likely to see in our outpatient clinics and knowing what to do uh, in these cases and which tests to order can help us move these patients safely and efficiently through. Thank you. Dr. Medina, thank you for your comments. Uh, I agree with what you've said. Uh, certainly, if there's any question of the normality of stress images, uh, we would consider doing the resting image on the spot. And the advantage of using a cadmium zinc telluride camera is you can still, even with the second dose, achieve ultra-low dose uh, radiation for the patient. Uh, in fact, this patient was a cardiologist in our community uh, and uh, has done uh, very well long term. He was quite anxious to have the nuclear study because he understood, as a former fellow of ours, uh, the excellent prognostic value of the testing. Uh, indeed, he has done uh, well long term on a uh, antacid and has had no further recurrence of his symptoms several years later for long term follow up. So we indeed were guided quite accurately and helpfully uh, by this stress only spec study. Uh, that concludes my comment.